Hi folks, Mark Allen, BH Spring Solutions LLC and BHSpringSolutions.com and we are back for session five of BH Spring Solutions Evaluation, Analysis and Testing of the Springfield SA35 High Power and uh, in session four uh, we made some changes. We put in the Type 1 uh, safety sear lever, heavy firing pin spring. Uh, eventually we did change out the original uh, recoil spring and, and installed the BH 17 uh, pound Progressive recoil spring. We fired 300 consecutive rounds, no stoppages, no malfunctions, and then we proceeded to start firing again, and we had a fail to extract. In the end of session four, we reviewed the, the symptoms that we had after uh, observed after that fail to extract. The uh, fail to extract was an empty shell casing left in the chamber, so the extractor did not hold. Um, the extractor tail. Um, and that's the part of the extractor that lives, I want to show you, when the extractor is installed, the tail part is right here. That part is over an area where the extractor spring lives, and it lives in that hole right there. And we noted that when we pressed down on the tail of the extractor, it didn't seem to have the kind of hard resistance that we expect. Um, we did the shake test, which means, you know, we take the slide off and um, the, uh, uh, put a uh, cartridge behind the extractor. And we didn't have the hold that we had. I think back in session three, we showed, uh, demonstrated the shake test and, um, when we did, the uh, extractor seemed to have a good, you know, firm hold on the cartridge casing. That wasn't so firm anymore. It was kind of marginal. The 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 uh, cartridge casing wobbled uh, when we did the shake test. So that was another symptom. And um, but here's the part that got tricky. And this this uh, no kidding was um, a nasty hidden little uh, concern. And um, uh, we're going to explain it to you right now. The extractor, which we pulled out, um, you know, we took some dimensional measurements of this, compared it to a Browning Mark III extractor, um, compared it to some blueprints, and there's nothing we could find wrong with this extractor. It may not be uh, quite as, uh, in some ways, design efficient as uh, a Browning extractor, but, you know, it, it, there's nothing, nothing inherently wrong with it. So the extractor is, is uh, not deemed to be causative. Um, the extractor spring itself, you know, it's not deformed. It's not showing the signs of degradation we see when extractor springs are worn out. And my goodness, it's a brand new OEM spring. Should be nothing wrong with it. We find nothing wrong with it. However, when I, here's what happened. I, when I pulled the extractor out, you know, I started, uh, you know, looking at the extractor under, magnifica under magnification and I couldn't find anything fractured, missing, and just there was nothing to see. Um, and then I pulled out, or I, I attempted to pull out the extractor spring. And I couldn't, it, it did not just lift right out like I just showed you right here. And and so this was uh, this was kind of strange. So then I started kind of pulling on it and with my fingernails and it didn't come out. I thought I'm going to have to get a needle nose pliers and then I pulled harder and finally it popped free. Okay, so I go back to looking at the extractor and then it hit me. You know, what's going on with that uh, extractor spring? And um, here's what makes this a nasty, nasty little thing to find. Um, the extractor spring right now in and of itself you know it's it's very normal uh when you install a high power extractor spring you put it in the hole right there it goes in very smoothly but normally when you take this spring out you can normally just do this just drop it out in your hand like that um and i remembered that we couldn't do that and um so you know i went back to this i reinstalled the extractor and um, you know, cycled the gun a few times. I dry cycled some ammunition through it. I pressed down on the tail, and I couldn't really tell too much about that part uh, if it was firm or if it wasn't, you know. And I was kind of unsure about that. I take the extractor back out again. This spring is stuck, 
And so then I go to look for what's going on. I put the spring in just like this. And then listen to this. Did you hear that? Okay. Now, what I just did is I compressed the spring the same way the tail of the extractor is going to compress the spring when, the spring when we install the extractor. And now watch this. That spring literally was stuck. And listen again. Hear that? Click, click. When a spring is compressed, it will naturally bulge. When that spring bulges, it's getting interference in with some slide serrations. And no kidding, I mean, it is dead stuck in there. And you'll hear it kind of pop when it uh, finally lets go. And um, when that spring is literally stuck in there like that, it here's what it cannot do. First of all, it's difficult to even pull the spring out. That's much less the spring cannot apply pressure in this direction towards the tail of the extractor. That's what gives the extractor claw the ability to hold on to the empty cartridge casings when they need to be extracted. In this circumstance, this extractor spring cannot do its job, which is to put its full force its full pressure on the extractor tail it can't move itself by the act of decompression of the spring because it is hung up it is hung up and i'm going to show i thought the best way to do this would be to show some close-up pictures take a look at the ends of these slide serrations in the extractor channel now you know, it could be a trick of the photography, it could be an optical illusion, I suppose, but it sure does look like the ends of those serrations are encroaching into this channel. The channel, this is where the extractor itself lives. And like I said, it could be an optical illusion, but it's not an optical illusion when you see the part right there. Those are marks from the serrations that I just showed you that appear to be encroaching into the extractor channel. That's because that's evidence that they are encroaching into the extractor channel. A little more close up looks just like that. And you see the whole line of the serrations all the way back here to where the um, extractor spring lives underneath the tail right here those serrations are bothering the extractor. Um, the extractor and extraction in the high power pistol, this is one of the Achilles heels, the real Achilles heels of the high power design. It is a system that works and is incredibly reliable when everything is maintained and everything is clean and everything is perfect. Um, and it, yeah, of course, it can run, you know, with sometimes with, you know, a 10 year old extractor spring and it can run with a very dirty extractor claw um, and sometimes remain stone cold reliable. However, um, there's not a lot of margin in the design. The extractor claw is not oversized. Um, this system needs to be optimal. What is not optimal in, in this, what we're seeing going on? First of all, the extractor spring cannot do its core job. Its core job to put upward pressure or outward pressure on the tail of the extractor, it can't even move, much less, you know, apply force up in this, uh, in this direction. And the extractor itself, it is coming in contact with those uh, nasty slide serrations and it's encountering resistance ultimately this system of this spring and this extractor these must be free to function as they were designed and intended to function both in range of motion unrestricted um, by metal to metal contact and in terms of the extractor spring um, having enough room uh, in order to to live and function in its environment as well so the thing that we have facing us here is every one of these slide serrations, these have got to be filed back 
or ground back or sanded back or polished back or however you want to look at it. We got too much metal going on here. My theory, and I don't know if it's true or maybe it is or maybe it isn't, but my theory is probably this slide was machined uh, where the the extractor channel was machined first and the, then the slide serrations were were uh, serrated uh, uh, and, and machined uh, after the channel and you wind up with what you see in this uh, in this picture I I think um, it would stand to reason to me that if you machine the slide serrations and then you kind of like back cut the 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 extractor channel so to say into the slide serrations I think you would do a straight out cut and you don't have that 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 um, problem of those sharp edges um, <clears throat> ideally where these edges meet the, ch the smooth channel this needs to be a transition really it, it needs to be almost sort of like the effect of a barrel crown almost where you have uh, an element of smoothness and positivity into the extractor channel and not anything encroaching certainly into the extractor channel so the challenge that we have ahead of us right now and um, honestly at this point I'm not exactly sure how this is going to work out because I don't know exactly how we're going to do it we need to get into that extractor channel safely we need to get these sharp edges those ones that we saw that are bothering the extractor body we need to get those relieved back so that they are the edges these down edges here are um, up to the edge of the uh, extractor channel appropriately we're wanting to accomplish this without a guy having to buy a refinish for his slide and I think that's the big implication here is um, you know this this can be altered um, it can be made okay and it's not a world of metal that we're talking about relieving in order to do this uh, but um, you know it's it's certainly also involves some metal that if we don't approach this uh, in a in a good way that that uh, it just it may necessitate a slide refinish because it uh, could be a little unsightly potentially so um, that's what we're going to uh, that's what we're going to be attempting next and uh, we'll see you here in the next video after we've made a little progress okay so we have uh, explored a couple of different uh, options here one was a flat file a flat file is going to have a downside of not being able to get up in here where we need to get to where the uh, extractor spring lives and that metal that's getting too close and encroaching around the extractor spring when it gets compressed but also those uh, my god they look like teeth don't they um, I did take a flat file and I ran it here and I gotta tell you that's gonna take uh, half the night I think to get those edges down um, but having ran a flat file in there it kind of does show in an exaggerated way those uh, serrations and how they are getting into that uh, channel so what I've decided and we're gonna hopefully have a good outcome from this but we've got this tool and I can use it at the bottom of the extractor channel coming up come on one side come the other side and I think as long as the tool on a Dremel does not stay in one place I think we're going to clean those edges in the channel with that carefully and um, and uh, I have a hunch we're going to be okay I think we may be able to even get in here and uh, get the edge all the way around where the uh, extractor spring lives but uh, we're about to find out okay we're back after the little bit of surgery and I have here the original Springfield extractor spring we got down in here with some uh, tools on a Dremel um, the main tool we used was that one that one fits in the extractor channel and we were able to come in clean on both sides worked real good and uh, you can see where we've been in there with that tool there top and bottom the the part though that kept getting the extractor spring stuck was actually down in the hole and um, 
I could not um, get nice reaction out of the extractor spring until I got down the hole with uh, with that tool. Show that, and just down in the hole, and it was around and around because that hole is dimensionally smaller than a uh, FN Browning extractor spring hole or maybe anybody else's but with either the bh extractor spring or the springfield extractor spring um, we can now install compress we get no kind of hanging up sticking or anything like that i believe we have the um we are going to go with the bh extractor spring though i like its construction better we're also going to be extra uh, replacing out the extractor pin that's what happened to the Springfield extractor pin after a couple ins and outs. The sear lever pin, same way, it wasn't long for the road. But here before we uh, reassemble, I'm also going to take this extractor that's got all those uh, serrations on it and uh, serration marks on it, and I'm going to re blue that. And um, we're going to see if we can. Uh, kind of do a reset on that extractor so to say and um, we're going to start clean and then if we see any more of those marks coming back in those areas we'll know those are kind of uh, fresh and for the channel I kind of took and cut down a uh, q-tip so I'm hoping to fit this down in that channel and this is just uh, I think super blue uh, birchwood uh, super blue coal bluing and we're just going to get up in that channel on that bare steel and get some bluing on that we'll get down into the hole itself as well and we're going to be leaving that set for a minute or so and that's all going to get flooded out with water and then we're going to compress air blow out the slide and and then reapply a nice coat of uh nice coat of oil but um i think everything now is going to be uh is going to be looking okay i don't think we uh, hurt the aesthetics of anything uh in any terrible way and uh we'll be right back with the reassembly so folks how did our job on the extractor and the extractor channel and everything, how'd that work out? Looks, uh, looks pretty good from here. Um, and we also have a really good hold with uh, our extractor in the, uh, in the uh, slide. That's uh, our shake test, by the way. That tells me that um, the extractor is doing a really good job holding that cartridge casing. However, one thing has changed is we've had a chance to handle the Springfield work with it uh, over the last couple of days. We cannot uh, get that extractor hole that you're seeing right there that is silent where you don't hear any rattle, no wobble. We can't get that with the Springfield SA35 extractor. And I'm going to just demonstrate that for you real quick and I'm going to show you the causes and the reasons. You'll remember we cleaned out the uh, slide serrations, made room for the extractor to work unimpeded, uh, cleaned out the area with the extractor uh, spring and uh, all of that is working very very well. The original SA35 extractor cannot duplicate the shake test that I just showed you there and I'm going to go ahead and remove this extractor and install the uh, Springfield extractor and just show you and demonstrate what we're what we're talking about here now we're not going to go be going as far as to say that the Springfield extractor is defective um, we're not determining that. What we are going to be saying is uh, the Springfield extractor does not hold as well as an FN Browning design extractor does. And um, that's going to be rather obvious here in just a second. Uh, after we reinstall the uh, Springfield SA35 extractor and uh, we'll do the shake test again and then we're going to go ahead and take it on back out um, and we're going to show you what we now know is the the cause uh, of this less than 
the extractor hold we get with the browning. Um, you're going to remember our objectives of this test. We want to see the best function that is possible out of the, um, and you hear it. Um, I can't shake this cartridge out, um, and I'm not saying that this extractor is defective. I am saying that it is not holding um, the way the FN Browning extractor is. Um, when we did uh, one magazine of test firing, this was yesterday, uh, a 115 round magazine with the SA35 extractor installed and one 15, I'm sorry, 15 round magazine with the Browning extractor installed. Um, our spread of the ejection field of empty shell casings, in other words, the, the, um, the longest and the shortest uh, extraction distance we saw, it ranged with the SA35 extractor from two feet to six feet. And with the Browning extractor, we had extraction distances of four and a half feet to six feet. So one way we had a four foot ejection field spread and the other one we had 18 inches. And that would be characteristic of what you would see because an extractor that is holding like this tends to not hold consistently every time. Um, an extractor that is holding with the kind of authority that we're getting out of the Browning extractor um, tends to be much more consistent. And in this case, it bears out uh, that that is the case. So we went looking at these two extractors and, you know, just why is it that we're getting now the superior uh, hold with the, uh, with the Browning extractor and we're not with the uh, SA35 extractor. Um, it, it could be that, um, you know, we've been a few hundred rounds. We know that the uh, SA35 extractor is hardened to a uh, softer, hardness level than the Browning extractor by about 10 uh, HRC but I I don't I don't think so I think we have a couple of more like design things going on here I want to show you real quickly this is the SA35 extractor this is the FN Browning extractor and I want you to take a look at this area right here of the two extractors um, I call the this is the extractor claw right up here that's what uh, holds your uh, empty cartridge casing rim in order to hold it to uh, get it extracted out. You can see these are not exactly the same design, but this pocket, I call this area the pocket of the extractor claw, that pocket is deeper than on the uh, Springfield. The dimension from here to the pocket is different. Um, and it would appear that this pocket is deeper. Maybe that's getting a more authoritative hold on the extractor. I'm sorry, on the uh, cartridge casing. Um, that would be one for sure um, thing that, that could cause uh, the difference in what we're seeing. But there's another one. And this one here is in an important one to, uh, to understand. And I'm going to show you. Um, and that is the dimension here of the extractor claw. And what I'm talking about is measuring the thickness of the part. Uh, in other words, this way. And we're going to see what we have when we do that measurement. And you're looking at it right there. We've got 3.04 millimeters. Okay. Uh, that part, what we most commonly see when we measure, do that measurement, is about three millimeters. Um, and, and um, you know, if you get 3.04, 3.05, all the better, because the, the high powers extractor claw has never been accused of being oversized or overkill. It's not. It is a small extractor claw, especially based on, you know, more modern gun designs we see today. And you always see the bragging like in, you know, Guns and Ammo magazine or whoever when they do a review. This has a really Mongo extractor claw. Well, you know what? We found out that's a good thing because it holds better when that extractor claw is larger. So remember that it holds better when they, you have more engagement of metal to metal. Um, here's what we found with the... SA35 uh, extractor when we measure the same area and you're going to see it right there 2.88 so we're about 0.16 of a millimeter on a three millimeter part 
different and with the Springfield SA35 part um, you just have less metal holding on to the cartridge and you saw in my example here I took out I used the same extractor spring and uh, we you just saw the superior hold that we got with the Browning uh, extractor it's a bigger extractor claw <clears throat> I would hate to think that Springfield thinned down the extractor in order to try to accommodate those ratty uh, serration ends that were encroaching into the extractor chamber. Um, when we first um, uh, attempted a browning extractor in the Springfield, it didn't fit, obviously. You remember we were hacking, uh, the serrations were hacking on the uh, uh, and bothering the SA-35 extractor, uh, you know, we saw that. Um, the the browning extractor is a thicker part and you know if this one here you can understand the reason if the serration ends are bothering this thinner part um, getting this thicker part compatible in there was a no-go however once we got those serration ends back and they're not now encroaching into the extractor channel the 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 thicker browning part is compatible it fits it's not bothered by any dimensions it 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 now works and it works as you see very 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 well this part has an excellent reputation it is the one and only extractor that we know of that we have dropped in every high power to date and it works and that's just the bottom line it just works and so for that reason and for the reasons that you saw there um, we have made the decision that the Springfield SA-35 is a component that's going to be out as far as the continuing of our testing. We're not going to be continuing on with the SA-35 um, extractor. It's not the, um, it's, uh, you know, there is a superior part and it is available and we're using it um, by our choice because we just we know we're going to get more reliable function with an extractor that is holding onto those cartridge casings uh, better so that's one thing that we wanted to update you on um, another thing that we wanted to update you on and we're not going to put this back together we're going to show you real quickly um, another thing that we uh, we wanted you to see and that is yeah we should be able to do that just like this I installed a FN Browning um, hammer sear um, uh, uh, manual safety um, and the reason I did this is because we needed to see is that roaming safety I call it that the Springfield has that you know when the hammer is forward you're able to get the um, you're able to get the uh, uh, safety up far enough to interfere with the slide uh, you know moving forward that one um, I don't have all the guts in this one so that's why we're uh, seeing it this way but what I wanted to see is does other parts have that same problem and here is the manual of safety with this one we cannot get that to go high enough with the hammer forward in order to encroach and keep the slide from being racked so what that does in our in our testing is that clears the frame from being causative for that manual safety um, improper function um, that's a parts problem not a frame problem and that is good because that means you know this can be fixed with a part um, now the downside of this is um, and and I feel like we have to say that at this point this what you saw as far as the improper function with Springfield safety you cannot go out and replace the manual safety and fix that and you can't go out and replace the sear or the hammer and fix that and those three things I just mentioned those are your operating system that's the hammer assembly the sear and the manual safety these three parts work together replacing out one and not replacing out the other two can really get you into some seriously bizarre uh, function problems um, and it's one of the reasons why uh, the SFS system which we're going to be talking about uh, very soon um, 
it's drop in in virtually every high power ever made but it replaces out the triad of your operating system that being again the hammer assembly the sear and the safety um, we had uh, one in our shop today that was sent to us you know wanting us to fit uh, a manual safety that had been put on uh, the gentleman's Hungarian high power. The manual safety went on, had the original Hungarian um, sear and, and uh, hammer assembly. It's, it's, these are, quote, high power parts. However, this, this pistol um, could be, if it had been loaded, it could be fired with the manual safety fully engaged. Uh, the hammer could be cocked from the half cocked position. Um, it, 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 it just, there was, you know, things were just not, not good. And there was no way to fit that because this is a problem caused by too little metal, not too much, and you can't put metal back on these parts. So, um, that's a reminder about, about the high powers operating system triad. Please don't attempt. Um, this is not, uh, dining room table gunsmithing on Saturday. Um, for for do-it-yourselfers when you get into the operating system unless you are replacing out all the parts with mated parts you're better off not to go there and if you are needing to go there you really need to be replacing those parts out with mated parts or having uh, a qualified gunsmith or BH service department or somebody um, do that install and do all the safety checks and all the necessary fitting in order for you to do that. So we were able to confirm that the original uh, safety issue with the um, with the uh, Springfield SA35 manual safety uh, is contained right here in this bag. So the original SA35 hammer assembly, original sear, and the original manual safety, these are going to be out of our testing protocol and those are going to be replaced with the uh, SFS operating system in this case. We could go, and, and I did shoot two uh, magazines yesterday when we tested the extractors with this operating system. Functions fine. We could uh, continue on our testing with it. The problem is these operating systems are no longer available um, and they're not being made anymore so there's no source for these operating systems you know, to buy them. This came out of another uh, you know uh, existing Browning high power. Um, so therefore you know we we've got to go down a road that's going to you know have our have us shooting a firearm that has you know correct functioning controls and safety an operating system and um, and that's you know this so hence that's the uh, the direction that we're going to go um, the uh, extractor spring is going to be a BH extractor extractor spring from here the uh, SA 35 extractor spring started to show and this is the main reason that we're taking it out of the uh, testing if you see it there it's started to kind of create a curvature in itself where it's not really completely straight anymore that is a spring trying to get itself out of its job and get itself out of the way so um, we won't be doing that our BH knowledge base um, the written report text about everything we're doing with the Springfield SA 35 has been updated it's now about 20 pages um, it has a summary of the SA 35 components that we are not continuing to test at this point it also has a list of why those components have been um, uh, why they are out of the testing um, in some instances it's because there's superior components available that add margins of safety and that's uh, you know our choice um, some pins didn't uh, hold up that were in the pistol originally those got replaced some springs like the extractor spring recoil spring those have and are uh, being replaced so this is going to get you up to date through this this uh, segment of uh, high power university and our special uh, study uh, and testing of the springfield sa35 that's going to tell you exactly where we are and it's also going to show you uh uh, some other things we uh, talk in here uh, going forward we're going to be using the BH spring solutions uh, barrel um, we've had no negative um, experiences with the uh, SA 35 barrel we're going to be uh, changing over to the uh, to the BH barrel for several reasons one is that cutout on the side of the chamber right there 
does two things. It's number one, an ejection port gives you more margin for empty shell casings leaving the pistol, but also in this spot right here, that's a visual loaded chamber indicator. So you're going to be, we're going to be. And that loaded chamber indicator, uh, or, or some people would call it an ejection port, um, that loaded chamber indication as many rounds as we're going to be firing out of this pistol it's just something that i want because i find myself looking uh, at my own high power more often uh, daily actually um I, I you know turn it over and on the side and look and i can see that there's a uh, brass colored uh, color inside the uh, chamber and I know the I know the weapon is loaded um, some other benefits that we're going to get from the um, from the BH uh, advanced barrel for uh, for high powers um, it is uh, a, a tighter twist rate should help us on accuracy as far as on performance um, our barrels have a reverse rifling twist it's a left turning rifling uh, turn instead of a right hand and the left turning uh, rifle twist is kinder to uh, right-handed shooters in terms of muzzle flip um, so that's another uh, another benefit that we're going to be uh, getting and it we're about 5 to 10 HRC harder uh, hardness um, than in the Tissos barrel and so we're going to be we're going to be uh, changing out the barrel for our testing um, this chamber um, is much more refined uh, much more like a funnel funnel if you will um, it's much it, it, it's it's made for smoother feeding and extraction and I think we have a better chance for um, for uh, excellent function and uh, excellent all-around function uh, with the BH advanced barrel so we're going to be testing with it uh, from this point going forward and we're going to do one more quick modification I told you we're going to go ahead and take out the FN operating system there's no point in testing something that there's no supply of um, remember this guy that is the 8400 round TISOS BR9 uh, and you're going to see lots of components are missing out of it today. We've kind of retired this old girl, but um, one thing that's still in inside is the uh, SFS system that we already got 8,400 rounds on. For those of you who don't know, the SFS system is hammer forward condition one carry. When you pull the safety off the hammer cocks, now it's ready to fire when you want to go on safe. Um, is this going to keep the roaming safety from roaming up? Yes, because SFS is made purposely where you can't manually push the safety on that way. Um, you can't ride that safety up ever. Um, and when you go on safe, it's just, uh, it's just that simple. So we're going to be installing this system into the uh, SA35 to start the next, uh, start the next session. We're out of time for this one. Uh, and then we're going to be back at the range and we're going to be back putting a lot of rounds through this Springfield. I'm really excited, really optimistic that uh, we have uh, constructed a setup or we're almost done constructing a setup that's going to be, uh, I think it's going to be highly reliable based on everything we've seen in the frame and slide here in the uh, Springfield so far. Um, it appears that with some optimal uh, internals, um, this is going to be this is going to be quite a uh, quite a handgun to uh, to have. So anyway, folks, thanks for watching along uh, w watching along with us. Uh, this is BH Spring Solutions High Power University special session about the evaluation and analysis of the Springfield SA35 High Power, and I'm Mark Allen for BH Spring Solutions LLC and BHSpringSolutions.com. Thank you for watching, folks.